Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Cinema of the DFF, the Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum. I'm Laura Teixeira from the Cinema Department, and I'm very happy to welcome you here for the continuation of our series uh, on Chantal Ackermann, the inventor of the form, the Cinema of Chantal Ackermann. As you probably already know, we've been doing this program since October last year, and um, continuing. It will continue until July. So. Um, just if, in case you're here for the first time, do have a look at the full program because we are having lots of other very nice um, lectures and films in this program. And tonight we have our dear Sonia Campanini who will talk to us about uh, La Chambre and um, Hotel Monterrey. And um, I just would like to um, thank our partners in this program, especially the, the uh, Institute for Theatre, Film and Medien from the Goethe University and Professor Vincent Schrediger, with whom we've been organizing this uh, program together. And of course, the Excellence Cluster, Normative Orders and the um, City of Frankfurt, the Friends of the University and the Hessen Film and Medien Academy for their support on this series. Um, for those who uh, also want to check out the films, um, we're going to be um, um, repeating the films again in case you just want to watch them again. And we're also showing other accompanying films on top of the program of the series. So do have a look in our website and in the program of the Film Museum where you can see all the accompanying programs as well. Um, we are just yeah, also in case you um, saw in the program, we had a little mistake. We said that the uh, lecture of tonight would be in German. It's actually going to be in English. There was a little misunderstanding, so I hope that's fine with everyone. The films, uh, we don't have a language problem since it's all uh, without dialogue. So um, the films from tonight are silent anyway, so we don't have a language problem there. And um, yeah, I hope you all stay for the screening and for the talk afterwards. We're going to have the chance to ask questions about the film and about the lecture afterwards. So I hope many of you will stay and ask questions. And that's it from my side. And now Professor Vincent Schrediger will present our lecture from tonight. Thank you for coming. Yes, uh, thank you, Laura. And good evening from, from my side. Um, Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher and mathematician, uh, famously introduced the distinction between the esprit de géométrie and the esprit de finesse, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of uh, the fine distinction or the, the moral sense, but also the artistic sense. And uh, he, he meant this distinction to offer, in a way, a, a sort of characterology of intellectual temperament. So people would tend to be either esprit de géométrie, leaning towards the esprit de géométrie, or leaning towards the esprit de finesse. Um, but, you know, some people, like himself, of course, combine the two. And uh, I would say one of the people who combines both these sides, the spirit of exact mathematical, scientific, thought and inquiry and an artistic and moral temperament was last week's guest, Babette Mongold, uh, who, as we all learned or discussed also in our discussion, uh, earned first uh, earned a degree in mathematics and then became a cinematographer and uh, a very important um, filmmaker and artist. And uh, it was actually Babette Mongold who came up with the idea for the title of the series uh, because there's a, a short little text that she wrote about Chantal Ackermann looking back on how their friendship started and how their collaboration started in the early 70s called uh, Mon Ami Chantal, which is published in, in a volume of writings of by Babette Mongol that was published a few years ago, uh, three or four years ago, uh, where she basically said when they first met in New York, and made the films that Sonia is going to talk about together. Um, what brought them together uh, was a the experience of not being heard in a male-dominated uh, film world, uh, film production setting, and the desire to invent a new language, to invent new forms that would be appropriate to their experience. And that, in a way, is the project they set out jointly, set out together to achieve. And uh, the first two really memorable and impressive uh, examples of what 
the work that they did together are the two films that we're going to hear today. Um, I think I can say that another example of somebody who combines the esprit de géométrie and the esprit de finesse is tonight's speaker, uh, Sonia Campanini, who has a background, almost has a background in engineering. She went to an engineering high school and then uh, studied film studies in Bologna, but then sort of reverted back to technology and engineering in her PhD work, which she pursued and completed at the universities of Udine and Amsterdam, uh, where she wrote a, a groundbreaking dissertation on the restoration of film sound, uh, a topic that had up until that point been pretty much completely neglected in film studies and archival studies, and for which she, in her dissertation, laid the theoretical and practical groundwork uh, for future research. And um, it is also this dissertation that caught our attention when we went looking in the international academic market for someone who could fill the first professorship for film culture here at uh, Goethe University, uh, which we advertised in 2015 as part of our collaboration with the Deutsches Film Institute, the uh, Master in Film Culture um, which we set up to train scientific personnel for film archives and film cultural institution. And we were lucky enough to have Sonia apply for that job. And she has been with us for the last four years and has been a force at the department and for the program and has continued to uh, develop her groundbreaking research at the threshold of uh, technology studies, um, uh, material studies and film theory. Uh, so it is my distinct pleasure tonight to welcome you to the podium, and without further ado, uh, we'll get down to the business of presenting the two films. Please welcome together with me Sonia Campanini. Yeah, good evening, and thank you very much, Vincent, for this very kind presentation. Um, in the course of the lecture series, we have been following Ackermann's career almost backwards, a rebours. We began with Ackermann's future films from the 2000s, Almayer Foley and La Captive. We have seen her documentaries from the 90s, Death and Soot, and her films from the 80s, Toute Nuit and Golden 80s. We are now coming back to the 70s with the previous screening of Je Tuis L'Elle uh, and Anjou Pinard de Mandé, and the upcoming news from, from Home and Jean Dillman. Tonight's program is dedicated to Hotel Monterey and La Chambre, the two uh, films which marked the beginnings of Chantal Ackermann's career. It is my great pleasure, but also quite our responsibility, to introduce these two films to you. And I say responsibility because both films, as um, was already said, are without recorded sound. So my presentation would be the only sound and verbal accompaniment to these movie movies. On the other hand, there shouldn't be any big spoiler danger in my presentation, since in this film, to quote the title of Ackermann's monography by Yvonne Marguillet, nothing happens. The topics I intend to touch on this presentation are summarized in the title. I'll talk about space, movement and gesture, about following subjectivity and quietness, and also about New York. In touching on all these different topics, I intend to discuss one of the issues that I found more intriguing in Ackermann's work, that is the interwining of documentary and experimental forms in the representation of reality by cinematographic means. Chantal Ackerman approached cinema when she was a teenager. In interviews, she stated that she, stated that she decided to become a filmmaker after viewing Pierrot Le Fou in 1965, when she was 15. At the age of 18, Ackerman entered the Belgian Film School in Sass in Brussels. She dropped her study in the first term and started working independently on making her first film, Sot Ma Ville, Low Up My Town. The short film was shot in 1968 in the kitchen of Ackermann's parents. 
she raised the little budget needed for production by selling shares in a planned film on the Diamond Stock Exchange in Antwerp. She is actor, director and producer of the short film and involved some friends in the making of it. In 1971, as uh, Vincent recalled, when she was 21, Ackerman moved to New York, where she remained until 63. In New York, she met cinematographer Babette Mangold, who became a close friend and an essential, essential uh, creative collaborator, contributing as a camera woman in various Ackerman's films. During her New York stay, Ackerman worked on four films, Hotel Monterey and La Chambre, News from Home, and The Unfinished and Lost Hanging Out Yonkers. To sustain herself in New York, Ackerman did different jobs. She work, worked as a waitress in the restaurant La Poulard, in a second-hand shop as a salewoman, and then as a cashier in the porn cinema Playhouse on 55th Street. She recounted that often men who were buying tickets for the porn shows did not wait to get their change out of shame of being seen or recognized. So she kept the change for herself and raised a sum that allowed her to produce the films Hotel Monterey and La Chambre. This way, porn film movie would be used to make Ackerman first films. Thanks to Babette Mangold, Ackerman got in touch with the New York film avant-garde and the works of Mika, Swirl, Snow, Darren, and Brackage. Ackerman stated that she was deeply impressed by the work by Michael Snow, which she saw at the Anthology Film Archive. Her New York films, and in particular Hotel Monterey and La Chambre, are deeply influenced by the New York avant-garde scene and structuralist cinema. Also, in my view, this attribution only partially reflects the first works by Ackerman, and I, as I will elaborate further on. In the broader field of experimental cinema, structuralism is a particular approach aimed at investigating the structural characteristics of the cinematographic dispositive and film's formal properties. Film historian Adam Sidney, who in 1964 published Visionary Cinema, The American Avant-Garde, one of the first books on experimental cinema, recognized as a structuralist group uh, of film made by filmmakers Michael Snow, Hollis Frampton, Paul Sheritz, Peter Kubelka, among others. He defined structuralist film as having one or more of the following characteristics, a fixed camera position, the flicker effect, loop printing, and retrophotography from the screen. One of the founding works of structuralist cinema is Michael Snow trilogy on camera movements, wavelength, back and forth, and La Région Centrale. Snow trilogy is an exploration of a space by cinematographic means, in which he experimented with the different camera movements. Wavelength is a 35-minute long zoom in which the camera dissects a room by a progressive zoom. The film dated 1967, and I'd like to show a little excerpt from it. Could you please play clip one? I apologize for the quality, of course. Uh, the film was um, not in the right uh, format or uh, quality was, um, uh, but you got an idea of um, the kind of uh, work um, made by Michael Snow. Um, and uh, Snow followed a similar principle for La Région Centrale, made in 1961, in which he patrols a landscape using a robotic arm in order to create a film in which a camera moved in every direction and on every plane of a sphere. The film lasts 180 minutes and can be defined as a scientific survey of all the spatial dimension of a landscape. And I will um, now you sh uh, show you a short scene from that uh, film, please, clip two. Uh, you get an idea of, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's no um, poetic of uh, ex exploration of space. 
Um, can we go back to the uh, presentation, please? In the pyjama interview, um, Ackerman referred to the film La Région Centrale, stating, I saw it in New York when I was 21, thanks to Babette Mangold, who brought me into a world I hadn't known about, a world at the time very small, very covert. The sensory experience I underwent was extraordinarily powerful and physical. I was, uh, it was a revelation for me that you could make a film without telling a story. And yet, the tracking shots of back and forth in the classroom, with movements that are poorly special while nothing is happening, produce a state of suspense and as tense as anything in Hitchcock. I learned from them that a camera movement, just a movement of the camera, could trigger an emotional response as strong as from any narrative. Ackerman's interest in experimental cinema lay in the possibility to do films without a classical narrative, experimenting with and on the filming language, and using a reduced cinema vocabulary. Similar to Snow's films, Hotel Monterey and La Chambre are exploration of spaces by cinematographic means, and they are, inf uh, they are indeed influenced um, by structural cinema, like uh, the presence of fixed camera, extended shot, real-time recordings. I will now elaborate on Ackerman's films in relation to structural cinema, and in particular to the work of Michael Snow, focusing on the issue of space and movement. Ackerman's first feature film, Hotel Monterey, was filmed over one single night in a low-cost residential hotel situated in Manhattan, Upper West Side, between Broadway and 94th Street. It was shot by a small troupe composed by Ackerman, camera woman Babette Mangold, and an assistant. Throughout the night, they put the camera in different areas of the hotel and let it roll. The camera surveyed the hotel from bottom to, to top. It starts in the lobby and lounge area on the ground floor and ends up on the roof, passing through corridors, elevators, rooms. There is no dramatized action or narration, no actors performing, the camera just records what happens in front of it, resulting in a counterpuntal arrangement of lights, colors and shapes. The film was shot with natural light on a grainy 60mm film stock and is composed of long takes by a fixed camera with just a few tracking shots towards the end. The editing consists of a juxtaposition of the scenes in a paratactical way. The film has no sound, there is no need for spoken words. Ackerman work is often described as a cinema of duration or a slow cinema because of the wide use of long takes, almost real-time documentation, steady shot, and the absence of dramatized action. Instead of time, duration, and slowness, I would rather focus attention on the space dimension, elaborating on the concept of space portrait. The cinematic representation in this film focuses on single spatial elements, door, dimly lit corridors, dark elevators, rooms, windows, and hallways. The human presence gradually diminishes as the time unfolds and we delve into the night. The cheaper residential hotel hosts mainly people with precarious backgrounds. Ackerman had lived in the hotel for a month in order to get acquainted with the spaces and its inhabitants, so that her presence would become familiar during the shooting and people wouldn't be disturbed by the presence of the camera. In the first part of the film, we see people in the lobby, in the elevator, in the corridors, then we see them in the rooms through open doors. The camera observes the da sign, the pure existence of spaces, people, objects, movements. The special exploration of the space is not a scientific dissection, as in the case of Wavelength and La Région Centrale. 
The film reveals the mystery and unexpected beauty of a cheap hotel and its occasional occupants. The space exhales a spectral and lonely atmosphere, somewhere between a painting by Edward Hopper and a scene from Shining. This space is represented here in relation to the daily life of its inhabitants, old people and outcasts of American society. The space refers either to the presence or to the absence of human subjects. The special relationship of near, far, empty, full, upside down indicates a relationship between subjects and objects in the space. The space of the hotel has a particular significance in this regard, since it is a home away from home, a space of transit in which the intimate and private dimension overlaps with the public and collective one. What I've called the space portrait is also a social portrait, depicting a collective subject, the people living in the hotel. It is a portrait of a geocultural space in the United States. In this sense, Hotel Monterey is the first of a series of space social portraits in which Ackerman depicts American culture in topographical terms, like in News from Home, Sud, De l'autre côté et soit d'Amérique. Let me now jump to the second theme of my talk, movement, by analyzing La Chambre, the room. The film is 11 minutes long, the length of a 6 mm roll, and consists of one single take in which the camera surveys in a continuous movement Ackerman's one roomed apartment on Spring Street in New York. Ackerman experiments here with the cinematographic language, reducing the elements to their minimum. One room, one camera, one subject. The film is shot by Babette Mangold. The camera slowly pans in full circle three times and does 480 uh, um, um, degrees pans inside the one-roomed apartment, showing the whole space, a kitchenette, a stove, a skin, a table, a desk, a bed, a cabinet, a red chair. To define the role of the camera movement, and in particular the panning in La Chambre, I would like to recall the film Back and Forth, 1969, by Michael Snow. It is shot in a classroom at Dickinson University and consists of horizontal and vertical camera pans done at different speeds. Can we play clip number three, please? So comparing these two films, I would argue that there is a difference in the intention and unfolding of the camera movements. Snow's camera movement dissects the space scientifically. It seems like a purely mechanical movement automatically generated. The camera is a scientific measurement instrument. The space is a microscope slide. When there is human presence, it is just a biological life form. On the other hand, Ackerman's film expresses something more than a pure structuralist journey in a space. This space only exists in relation to a particular human subject. It is an expression of the subject inhab inhabiting it. The camera movement is not a mechanical eye dissecting a space, but a living observer, a witness contemplating how human life flows and unfolds in relation to space and objects. The pan movements are slow. We have the time to observe the single objects, the single pieces of furniture. We might ask ourselves how these objects are used in everyday life. When the camera movements meets the bed on which Ackerman is lying, looking towards the camera, a new set of relations is established between the subject, the objects, the space, and us as a viewers. At every new panning, this set of rel relations is enriched. Each time the camera movement reveals something more about the space and the subject who inhabits it, it is a progressive unveiling of the intimate and private space of a woman. And yet the camera does play a role in this set of relations. 
Its positioning and its movements enter the space and become part of this set of relations. In this sense, I define the camera movements, these uh, circular panning shots, as camera gestures. They are gestures in the context of the profilmic because during the shooting they enter with a corporal quality into the set of relations comprising the subject, the objects and the space. But these movements are also gestures towards the spectator because they produce a corporal sensation, perception and emotion as if uh, the viewer were experiencing the material and physical presence of the subjects and objects represented. In this sense, the material and phys um, Ackermann's work combines a structuralist and, uh, approach with a phenomenological one. This brings me to the final topic of my talk, gestures, intended not as camera movements, but as gestures performed in front of the camera. In La Chambre, Ackerman does not perform dramatic actions, she lies, she turns around under the sheets, it's an apple. All these actions do not have a cause or effects, they are pure performative gestures. If we look at Ackerman's films, we can find a wider range of um, a repertory of gestures, um, who are not directly re related to a dramatic action. The little gesture of everyday life. Above all, the daily gesture of a woman, like cooking or making coffee. The representation, but also critique, of everyday life gestures was already present in Ackermann's first film, Sotmaville, which consists of Ackermann's solo performance as she returns home and engages with different objects in her kitchen. And I will now show the uh, initial scene from Sotmaville, Blow Up My Town. In her performance, Ackerman depicts the repetitiveness, absurdness and schizophrenia of daily life's gestures. As observed by Yvonne Marguillet, the film expresses the intentional self-annihilation by lighting a match over a gas stove. One can recall here the discourse on the critique of everyday life by French philosopher Henri Lefebvre. In his book, The Critique of Everyday Life, Lefebvre defines everyday life as the intersection of, uh, I quote, illusion and truth, power and helplessness, the intersection of the sector man controls and the sector he does not control. In Lefebvre's view, Processes of alienation, in Marxist terms, pertain not only to industrial contexts of production, but spread out into other social contexts pertaining to the private and public spheres. In capitalistic society, alienation conquers the spheres of the quotidian as, uh, as home and leisure time. Ackermann's film Jean Dillman represents the epic and critique of everyday life gestures a real-time study of a middle-aged widow's routine, as we will see in the lecture series in June. In relation to Jean Dillman, Ackerman stated in an interview published in Camera Obscura in 1977, uh, 77, sorry, if you choose to show a woman's gesture so, uh, if you choose to show a woman's gesture so precisely, it is because you love them. This is uh, the reason why I think it is a feminist film, not just what it says, but what is shown and how it's shown. And it is true that if on one hand in this film everyday gestures are represented as alienating, on the other hand they are contemplate, contemplated in their beauty and familiarity. While preparing this talk and reflecting on the rep uh, representation of daily gestures, a particular scene is recorded in my mind, and I'm allowing here a little digression, a little detour, uh, with clip number six, please. This scene is from Umberto Di, the generalist movie directed by De Sica in 1952. Maria, the young maid in the boarding house where Umberto Di lives, wakes up, goes into the kitchen and makes coffee. She does each gesture automatic automatically, as she does every day, 
even though on this particular morning she is emotionally upset about the possibility of being pregnant. In this scene, there is a little detail that, to me, contains all the repeated action in Jeanne, in Jeanne Dillman, the marks left by the matches struck on the wall. This endless series of lines, each standing for every singular day on which she has lit the soul. The reference to Umberto D is not just a free association. From the very beginning of her career, Ackerman has indeed taken a realistic, neorealistic and humanistic approach in her films, which runs alongside the experimental one. Ackerman herself has stated that il faut mettre en la vie, it is necessary to capture life. This brings me to the last point of, uh, I want to make, recalling the title of my talk, Follow Me Quietly. I start quoting a comment left on YouTube by the user Robert Bonter under the clip showing the initial scene of Jean Dillman. The most boring, monotonous film any director ever made. In this film, they just show the woman doing her clean-up course around the house, plus cooking, etc. They do not show the good times she provides the client early in the film. People go to movies to get away from in in incessant routine like this. This is not a movie. This is a diary of an ordinary woman's ordinary day. Just awful for this to be considered a director's greatest work. As an answer to that comment, it is worth recalling Cesare Zavattini text Some Ideas on Cinema from 1952, in which he theorized and conceptualized the principle of neorealism, and I quote here, no doubt, uh, no doubt one's first and most superficial reaction to everyday's reality is that it is tedious. Until we are able to overcome some moral and intellectual laziness, in fact, this reality will continue to appear uninteresting. One shouldn't be astonished that the cinema has always felt the natural, unavoid unavoidable necessity to insert a story into the reality to make it exciting and spectacular. At the, uh, all the same, it is clear that such a method evades a direct approach to everyday reality and suggests that it cannot be portrayed without the intervention of fantasy and artifice. Here, Zavattini announces the eman emancipation of cinema from the need to tell a story and to tell it in classical Hollywood terms. The same idea of emancipating cinema language from narration was pivotal in Ackerman's first works, and we can interpret main, uh, many, many films by Ackerman in the light of Zavattini's ideas on cinema, as for instance in the following passage, and I quote again from uh, Zavattini. Why the cinema used to make one situation produce another situation and another and another again and again, and each scene was thought out and immediately related to the next, the natural uh, result out of a mistrust of reality. Today, when we have thought uh, about a scene, we feel the need to remain in it, because the single scene itself can contain so many echoes and reverberations can even contain all the situation we might need. Today, in fact, we can quietly say, give us whatever fact you like, and we will disassemble it, make it something worth watching. Sabatini expresses here the principle of making a film scene out of an everyday gesture and the need to remain in the scene. He intended cinema as an analytical documentary showing scenes as they happen day by day in their dailiness, their longest and truest duration. He states here the importance of the banal dailiness of taking, I quote, any moment of a human life and showing how striking that moment is. Zavattini elaborates on what he calls Teoria del Pedinamento del Reale, a theory of following and tailing of the real, 
cinema should capture everyday life, the life of each person is a potential film. The camera should follow the character in every event and situation. There is no more a hierarchy in gestures between actions worth recording and gestures without significance. Potentially, each gesture has the dignity of representation. In our film, Hackerman shows a similar intent of following the real. To describe uh, the, the way Ackerman follows reality in her work, I use the term quietly in the title of my talk. Quietness seems to me to properly reflect the tone and attitude towards her representation of reality. The camera remains unobtrusive and unnoticed. It follows quietly the unfolding of reality, either with static long shot or with slow panning and tracking shots. In conclusion, I would argue that is, uh, this attitude towards reality is exactly what differentiates Hotel Monterey and La Chambre from pure structuralist cinema. Ackerman combined the experimental approach towards the cinema language with a realistic and documentary attitude towards the represented reality. And this melange will characterize also her later work, from News from Home, Jean Dilmand and Histoire d'Amérique. Ackerman said in 1982, I passed through a phase in which it was inconceivable to be figurative or narrative. You had to go through abstraction. Now, with the quest of the abstract, you can again make either the figurative or the abstract. But this figurative will never be the same again. And with our words, I conclude here my presentation. I will just add a final footnote. Um, Ackerman did a second version of La Chambre in which she read a text to accompany the film images with their voiceover. Uh, the film is lost, but the written text survived, and I leave it here for you to read in order to prepare for uh, the screening of La Chambre and Hotel Monterey. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the screening. Thank you, Sonia, very much for this great introduction. We're going to leave the screen on a little bit more. We're going to make a 10 minute break and then we come back and start with the screening of the films. Thank you. Um, and um, oh, I had a lot of questions popping up when seeing the film in the, for the first time in the big screen because watching it in the computer was something completely different. And here you can see so many more details of what's going on. Um, but first I would like to ask you, well, thanks for your talk first, because I think there was the examples and clips and things you pointed out were very interesting to um, to see this film and uh, with a certain background of the references that were definitely around, um, especially for the case of Michael Snow and everything. But I would like to start with, um, well, with the title of your talk in a way. Um, and well, the, with the question of the sound or the lack of it, because um, as we were putting up this program and when I saw that you had um, chosen to talk exactly about these films, I mean, I knew you as a sound specialist. I didn't know as much about your engineering background or your technical background as Vincent's prepared. Or it's, in his <laughs> not so much engineering. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I kind of knew you or saw you as a sound specialist. You, that you yeah. had this, this, um, um, this, uh, this specialty and then that you picked up exactly some of of uh, Ackerman's films that don't have sound. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you how how do you see this? How do you see this uh, choice of hers of the, in these films, or that they are sound, uh, without sound? And um, I was the question that I was thinking of during the films, like, what do you hear when you see this film, mm -hmm. or what does the lack of sound tell you uh, when watching this? Yeah, this is probably the answer I would give you because. Uh, I think it's a very interesting to, to think about how we experience this lack of sound in these movies. And um, so I was quite astonished how much silent was present in, in the uh, cinema um, when we were watching the movies, because um, 
I mean, I would have expected to hear no more noises. It, it was really very silent. <laughs> and uh, to me, it's... Um, I don't know. It, it, I think it's a very uh, subjective um, yeah, experience. The uh, this like watching the movies uh, without sound for such a long time, um, and probably uh, yeah. Th there's I actually this would be a question I would like to ask to the audience how they experience that. Uh, uh, the the lack of sound in these movies how um yeah how was um the 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 experience from the audience uh yeah this would be my question <laughs> does anybody want to share their experience yeah hi um i found it quite violent actually at first you think you're just watching it and it's slow and all that and then i started noticing my internal conversation in my own head with myself I then I thought of um this summer when I was in New York and then I suddenly it's, it's, and then you just catch yourself it's like doing a meditation and then you kind of realize that you've been kind of wandering off into all these kind of avenues and coming back and then I thought of notion of nostalgia and then I, I thought oh this film was made five years before I was born and then I thought about my entire childhood I don't know, it was just crazy, just like just like continuing, you know, just like starting off through these corridors and then I come back and then there's another corridor, you know. So then it got to the point and I realized this kind of absence gives more room to my own internal dialogue that's mm -hmm. kind of always there, nevertheless. And it just like allows it to kind of participate more and it allows it to kind of be way more... Of, kind of evident and like vivid you know I don't know that was my experience I think it was mm -hmm. great yeah thank you experience. very much uh, I think this observation or uh, uh, the experience of the internal voice feeling out the silence uh, of the movie uh, it's something uh, I find it really interesting but it's really a, a real subjective experience so if somebody else wants to share with us his uh, or her experiences, or like, uh, yeah, uh, I would be glad to hear um, that. Um. Or perhaps what I can say, um, which um, also goes in that direction, I think it's the, the notion of duration. It becomes mm -hmm. also much more extreme in a way. And I also had the impression I well started in first, okay, I was paying attention to the architecture and what was being shown. Then my mind wanders to something completely different. And then I can still come back to this uh, image. And um, I think it also has a lot to do with this, uh, with this notion of the duration as well, right? Because how, how long she really expands this um, and I think the sound adds to that duration in a way you know? it's almost like it's it feels almost longer because of the like of other sounds or other elements mm -hmm. in the um, in the film at least that was my my impression watching it today yeah. and um, that's also why I found it interesting to to um, uh, in, in the case of La Chambre, uh, to compare or to, to keep in mind that um, there was another version with, uh, with the text and to try to um, yeah, um, understand how would that be in with, with the spoken text. Uh, so, um, and regarding, I mean, uh, for, for uh, um, Ackerman, um, it was uh, a choice of... Um, also, like really experimenting with the visual language, we have seen that in her first movie um, she used sound. Uh, but uh, then, when when she uh, went to New York and uh, shot, um, shot these movies, um, she decided to to do that without sound. Um, yeah, it's. But again, uh, for if we compare that to uh, Michael Snow movies, in which sound plays a, a, a very important role in structuring this space journey. Uh, we have different uh, kind of uh, sounds, but it's taking part of this, um, yeah, of the structure of the film uh, strongly. And here, I think it really, um, the lack of sound really 
uh, helps in, in experiences in, in experiencing this quietness in the in the like the this yeah this kind of m m feeling of com contemplation meditation of uh, a sp space um, and of a room so it's um, um, probably it's because of that. I'm actually just wondering if it's really this kind of meditative, relaxed uh, silenceness uh, or silence that mm -hmm. that you are referring to, because as you as you mentioned uh, at the very beginning, uh, the the silence was very much present, and I was thinking a little bit whether it has to do with the fact that we are, you know, in a museum uh, kind of setting, uh, very attentive and very sort of restrictive. Mm -hmm. uh, as to how we behave as an audience and sort mm -hmm. of very careful not to, uh, you know, uh, mess with uh, each other's experience of the silent film and sort of not to venture into others' meditations and so mm -hmm. on. So for me it was uh, at the same time as, I mean, I, I also had these uh, inner uh, monologues with myself and the film, but it was also a bit stressful actually mm -hmm. uh, in terms of yeah the settings that we are in and sort of really uh, careful about uh, uh, not making any noises actually yeah thank you for your talk I was very much uh, directed by the quote that you showed in the beginning where you had the difference between um, abstract filmmaking and narration where uh, you have the quote from this interview where she um, opposes Hitchcock filmmaking, I think, as a mm. narrative cinema versus uh, Michael, Snow. Michael Snow and abstract filmmaking. And so I had I, more of a remark, not really a question, <laughs> but uh, so I had to think through the second film, the hotel film, through the logic of how you film a building as also mm -hmm. how, how, you, how the dramaturgy of the architecture itself gives the film structure that um, that the building has already and also a kind of linear logic that by going um, up during uh, the duration of the film. And then um, thinking through it, through the quote that you showed us, I had to think also of the Hitchcock films that do a very similar thing where you have films that... So I, I kind of want to... Um, I'm not convinced by this idea that um, Hitchcock is purely narrative or um, mm -hmm. these films are purely abstract because you always have the um, like the uh, the quality of the narration of the objects and the architecture itself mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, do uh, no, no, I just uh, uh, it's not really a question sorry, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I see your point and I, I would probably agree uh, since um, I mean it's uh, that there is also a, a narrative uh, quality in the film, um, in the sense that we we uh, like we on one hand we build our narratives or we try to making out sense of, uh, out of of uh, this uh, uh, yeah shots and uh, the presentation of the spaces. Um, on the other hand, um, yeah, she was referring to the fact that you can build uh, tension also without a story. Um, and in particular, she was referring to Back and Forth, uh, the film with the panning by Michael Snow. And I believe also in, this, in the case of Hotel Monterey, you um, experience in, in a sense like this tension, even though there is no no um, narrative line you are following, uh, or but there is, uh, I believe, uh, a quality of uh, tension and also, yeah, um, you you build your own narrative through the building. So it's like uh, when. In the final part, you have all these tracking shots back and forth, and then um, the final uh, shots outside the building. Uh, yeah, it, it seems like having reached a 
point of um, uh, yeah of um, in this narrative. Um, yeah. The end of the building too. <laughs> it's yeah, it's the end of the building, but it's also the beginning of the city, um, and and this relate to the um, following uh, film news from home, uh, in which Ackerman um, will shoot the city, accompanying um, this um, documentary um, uh, shooting with. The letters from her mother. So it's it's also it's also this relationship between um, closed internal space and then uh, outside spaces. Yeah, but then in that case, in the case of news from home, you have the narrative of the voiceover of Chantal Ackerman reading the letters. So you, uh, in that case, you really have a na narrative to follow. I have another question <laughs> or another <laughs> remark. Um, I also like now when you answer the idea of this internal space for the for the first film, um, because to me, I mean, in my other experience might differ, but um, it was much more symbolic, especially because you see the things several times and you see a repetition of the object. Um, I don't know if it was intended. For example, the the spindle that you see, the apple, of course, is a very symbolic object. Um, do you know anything about the the intent of it was it supposed it, to be of, read as of a the objects you mean of the uh, or was it her room um i i'm sorry or was it her room as is it, it, um, yes it was uh, i mean i i don't know to what extent she uh did arrange the objects uh i tend to answer that it, it was kind of her room as it was that there was i think i think uh, babette mangold uh, was saying um Two weeks ago, last week, two weeks ago, um, that she recalled that she uh, they shoot this La Chambre, uh, according to Babette, before Hotel Monterey, uh, whereas uh, Ackerman recalled to have shot La Chambre after the day after finishing Hotel Monterey. Um, it's, I mean. What I would uh, infer is that that they found this um, yeah this uh, this way of like speaking a new language with cinema, and they wanted to just experimenting it. Um, and m my understanding of it is uh, really um, sort of. Uh, I, I wouldn't assume that there was much of a preparation also in, in uh, of course, uh, there, uh, it's all, it was all uh, set in the way uh, sh they intended to do the, the shot, but I, I wouldn't say there was kind of uh, set design in this sense. But this is just um, yeah, my uh, understanding of it. I'm, I don't have any um, yeah, source uh, about that. I think it's interesting that you're working back to Babette Mangold because um, what this film for me resonates a lot is also the, the film we showed last week. I don't know how many of you have seen it. Uh, the camera je, la caméra I from Babette mm -hmm. Mangold. Because um, this film, for those who haven't seen it, the first part of the film is um, Babette in the photo studio filming the people she's taking photographs of. So it's very still. You see it from the back of the camera and every time she takes a picture you see like uh, as if the... Um, What's it called? The the camera um, taking the taking the picture. So it's very still film. And the second part of the film, she goes into the town and she films the buildings. And it reminds me a lot of the end of this film because she also sh she shoots it from the street level, but she's filming it above. So it reminds me a lot of the end of this Hotel Monterey. And that made me think so much about um, how bad how much of Babette Mangold is in this film. Of course, it's mm -hmm. a Ackerman film, but I think it's her her camera work has. Once you start seeing also the other works that she has done, you see how much it's important for, especially in this beginning of uh, mm -hmm. Ackerman. The this meeting with Babette was so important, and you see that a lot in the films now when you compare what else she has done as a camera woman. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. I also believe that um, it was in the end um, a 
pair work, a work done in pair by uh, Ackerman and, uh, and uh, Babek Mangold. Um, I think, um, yeah, that uh, the camera work here is really, uh, yeah, um, very important. And I would assume that they really decided together how to shoot the film. Uh, yeah. You have you have this tension, sorry, this, um, with the stillness and the movement. I think that mm -hmm. you have like the whole, almost the, throughout the film, these still shots, and then when you finally have a movement, you're like, oh, okay, the camera's moving. It really mm -hmm. um, calls your attention, and you have this repeated movement, which reminds us of the some of the micro snow clips. But I think that there was also very interesting how that develops throughout the film, and then I think that's the kind of narrative that I saw in the film in a way that uh, from this. Um, stillness to the traveling back and forth and then in the end this panoramic yeah. um, camera movement I think that's it becomes very essential to the film suddenly something that in more traditional narrative films you might not notice at all or not mm -hmm. notice as much um, as in this film it becomes for me very present like mm -hmm. the choice of the camera movement as well right yes yes We've really in a way like us uh, for F uh, Ackerman, a way of rediscovering or discovering the the basic vocabulary of uh, cinema language. So it's like, uh, yes, mm, static camera and then moving camera. This tracking shot. It's like, uh, yeah, a, a real like learning to tackle new language or language generally. Do we have other questions or comments from you? Otherwise, I would have another question, uh, or um, I don't know, perhaps it's also more like a comment, <laughs> but it was another thing that was resonating with me during the film, um, which is, um, I was also thinking of um, Jonas Mecca's film um, as I was walking around, uh, I was a as I was moving around, I saw a brief glimpse of beauty, uh, occasionally, uh, which we also screened here uh, a week ago or two weeks ago. And in that film, he shows these snippets of everyday life, mm -hmm. and he also puts some um, inserts of text. And one text that he often repeats is, nothing happens in this film. Mm -hmm. And he constantly says that. And I think you will very well notice this um, text by Yvonne Margolis, where mm -hmm. she, uh, nothing happens. And um, I think it's, um, it's such a, um, a crucial thing like that has to do with this whole narrative and, uh, and the language of cinema. In this case, it's at least something that is happening in this film. It's this whole experience with the language of cinema, not to mention all the other stories that one can perhaps see in the film um, for oneself. And I think in everybody that was watching the film, something, definitely something was happening. Uh, yeah. Life was happening in that moment as you were watching it. But perhaps you, ha you um, can talk a little bit more about this. Uh, nothing happens uh, in these films in particular, but also in general for, for Ackerman's uh, work. Uh, yes. Um in the end, it's this paradox because nothing happens, but it's everything is happening what we live in life. So it's like um, there is, uh, I mean, also I was thinking about uh, the elevators going up and down. It's, this is also an action and it's an action and maybe it's the, the everyday gesture of a building. So this kind of, um, there is, uh, it's uh, no action in a dramaturgical way, but it's something that happens continuously. Like you have these uh, elevators going up and down um, for, for a long time. And even though sometimes there is nobody inside, nobody is entering, but they still go. <laughs> so it's like... It's like a ghost elevator yeah. sometimes. You're like, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, so this is like, um, to me, this, this feeling of nothing happens, but um, even though nothing is happening, still everything happens um, Yeah, underneath or... Um, yes, uh, I, I would phrase it like that. Um, and generally, I mean, these these works um, are probably uh, 
yeah, the more experimental in uh, Ackerman's uh, um, filmography. But still, uh, and that was a point I tried to make in my talk, I see so many like uh, characters in this film that Ackerman uses later on in more, more narrative or fictional films. So it's um, this uh, mixture of yeah, uh, little gestures that don't really um, have uh, an action per se um, putting forward, but it's like, yeah, this, this time in which nothing happens, but still, uh, yeah, we, we are confronting with that reality that happens on, on screen. I don't know, this would be my, um, yeah, my take on it, but uh, yeah, don't know if somebody has, has a comment. I was just wondering about the people in the I was just wondering about the people in the movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was not a documentary, was it? It was I mean, it wasn't it was uh, it was it was staged for the most part. And uh, the people were were they they were there. They were, they weren't cast. No, they weren't cast. I mean, it was in this sense a documentary because she didn't uh stage the the action of the people. Right. So it was it was it was a verisimilitude more than 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 staging. Yeah. So uh, the thing that that struck me was the uh, the she was very aware of the camera in la chambre, mm -hmm. and because she stared at it as it as as it passed by, but the people in the movie seemed uh, the other movie uh, uh, Hotel Matar mm -hmm. seemed less some seemed almost blissfully unaware of the camera, and then some of them seemed to be. Um, acutely aware of it in the sense that a door would open, somebody would stare out, and you got the sense that they were thinking, oh, that lady with the, that crazy lady with the camera is still there. <laughs> yeah. Can't go out now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, uh, and this is, um, yeah, she, uh, she mm, tried uh, to be, uh, like less intrusive as possible, also um, by living in the hotel uh, for a month, so that people living there could. Um, they were uh, used to her. Yeah, they Present. were used to her. On the other hand, you see this different reaction to to the camera, and definitely, uh, yeah, it's interesting to to see how um, people would relate in, in that context to, to the presence of a camera in a hotel um, which was not certainly, uh, yeah, uh, yeah a w well, like... Uh, well, this was more like an SRO, I imagine, um, a single-room occupancy hotel where people were living there, that's where they lived, that was their home, yeah. as opposed to transient hotel where people come and go mm -hmm. and stay temporarily while yeah. visiting. Yeah, I believe it, this was uh, most like a residential kind of a hotel yeah. where people uh, who didn't have the possibility to have a stable home or were in... A more traditional apartment. Yeah, yeah. So that's also like this social aspect of, of the film. Um, yeah, uh, of portraying a situation which uh, is like between a hotel and a home uh, and yeah um, for um, and this relation between the private space but in a, in a com community space or a communal space um yeah Yeah, yeah, it's funny that that we uh, in in the end speak about uh, uh, the hotel, the people who live in, and and in the beginning I thought the same. Okay, do I see a documentary now about a hotel uh, without sound? And I was starting to think of okay, who is living there? What's the hotel like? Do we get some information about it? And then I noticed okay, there's none of it, <laughs> and even the the lack of sound about what we were speaking. Um, first of all gave me then the freedom of like just watching without having another layer of information mm -hmm. 
And at the moment I'm working a bit about William Eggleston, a photographer, uh, a bit later on. And um, he had this this um, this work done, Democratic Forest, where he speaks about the democratic of the the vicious things you you, you have in front of you, and uh, more and more throughout the the film, I thought, okay, we're coming now towards what's in front of us, the aisles, the 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 elevator. Just wasn't for me an elevator in the end. It was just an element, something, as you said, is coming and going, like a metaphor on, on other things. And, and in the end, we had like the walls, the lights. And just at the very end, we have this freedom to come back to something we know, a panoramic view or something. But but I, I like the idea just, just to leave behind um, that, oh, we do something about a hotel, what is it? No, it's not. It's just something in front of us and that I liked a lot. And the, the lack of sound helped me a lot entering yeah, it, yeah. I, I think in this sense it's really like a kind of exercise for us as a viewer to, to re-learn or, or to understand how we look at things, at, at moving images. Uh, and uh, yeah, as as Ackerman is uh, experimenting with the visual language, we are also experimenting with uh, our uh, like sensing, uh, senses and uh, with our viewing uh, experience. So how we perceive uh, the images wh when they go so in depth and for such a long time and we are just watching the same place for an hour without sound. It's like we really uh, yeah, perceive how our vision works in, in this sense, I think. Do we have any further comments or questions? Or anybody wants to share their experience as well? Um, or do you have any other questions for the audience? Or um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, because, uh, well, otherwise... Uh, I, I hope yes. uh, everyone has uh, enjoyed the film. It was, uh, yeah, probably uh, an experience that would stay with... <laughs> enjoying the sense of experienced... Uh, I experienced it, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to experience it again, or if you want to tell your <laughs> colleagues and friends to come and watch it, we're screening both films again on this Saturday, on Saturday at uh, 5.30 p.m., so a little bit earlier than the usual 6 p.m. slot because it's the night of the museum, so it's going to start at 5.30, and we're going to show again La Chambre and Hotel Monterey. So, um, yeah, do spread the word about this great experience uh, that we just had, um, and do look up the rest of the programs. We're screening News from Home that uh, Sonia has mentioned a couple of times. Uh, it's going to be the next lecture. We're also going to show Letters Home, which is a very different film that Ackerman also did. Um, with letters, but um, in a staged form with Devlin Sehig and uh, Coraline Sehig. Um, so do look up our program. I thank Sonia very much for your great talk and showing us these films and for answering all the questions. Thank you everybody for staying and uh, I'll see you next time here at the lectures. Thank you, Laura. <laughs>